Hello everybody, this is Havoc and welcome back to our Knight of Honor 2 Dev Diary Overview Series. In this series, I will combine uh, relevant developer diaries into groups, hopefully making a more cohesive look at the game overall uh, from the developer diary perspective. Now, the first one, we went over kind of the world setting, the game setting, and then part of the Royal Court. And today we have two very similar dev diaries, one going over warfare and then one going over your marshals, which is a class of knight that you can recruit. So remember, as I go through these dev diaries, that at any point you are enjoying the video to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel and turn on bell notifications. Let's dive into developer diaries number four and five for Knights of Honor 2 Sovereign. All right, so as I just mentioned, the first one is going over your military and warfare aspects of the game, covering things like the invasion process, battles, occupations, and assimilation. Though there are different strategies that players can explore to defend and broaden their empires, wars are going to be inevitable. They are the most straightforward expansion method. It's just warfare is the name of the game, and that's true to the historical era as well. However, victory is not always easy to accomplish. We're going to take a quick sidetrack though, because the territorial structure, which is something we went over briefly in the first developer diary uh, overview, this world is broken up into about 300 provinces, which vary greatly in size, settlement types, natural resources, geographical features, etc., etc. Each of these provinces is centralized around a single town, representing the province's seat of power. Ownership over the town equals ownership over the entire province, regardless of size, including all of their settlements. So, regarding control, it is a all-or-nothing format. This is very standard for Knights of Honor, so it's nothing strange to see it outside of here. There is an interesting exception in Knights of Honor 2, though. Keeps can be controlled separately from the provinces, which reduces the overall defensive capabilities on the province and provides some attrition damage against the enemies of a keep's occupier. Note that includes the army of the province's owner. So if I am attacking someone and they have a keep, I can attack and take that keep and then the owner who is still in control of that entire province because I haven't taken all their settlements then sees that defensive uh, capabilities reduction and then also that attrition. So it's almost all right off the bat, a strategy is to take the keep first, maybe sit there a little bit, weaken the defenses, especially if it's a stronger settlement, and then be able to take that a little easier. So they will take a closer look at provinces, the settlements, and the towns from an economic perspective, but uh, we're not, we're not going to approach that from a military standpoint in this developer diary. So back to overtaking an enemy town and a province. Conquering a town requires good preparation and a strong army, and it always, always starts with a siege. Sieges are long, with different ways in which defenses can crack. One of the bigger primary factors is based on the defender's resilience. Another major factor is how strong and experienced the enemy troops are and the marshal are at siege warfare. You also take into account elements of the town itself. Is it well guarded? Is, are their walls strong? How long will their food supplies last? You know, if you starve them out, the defending armies can be driven into a desperate uh, siege attempt or attempt to break the siege rather or forced into surrendering. Once the defenders are lured into a break siege battle or the attackers start a full-fledged assault, things develop quickly. Now, they obviously don't go into that, so I'm hoping we will see an actual kind of siege set up sometime in the future, uh, but as it sits right now, those are pretty much how a siege goes down. If the attackers win, the province is now occupied, as previously stated. Now, they have control, but they don't have ownership. In this specific state, they cannot substantially benefit from the province, but neither can the owner. All constructions, production, trade, army training, and otherwise are put on hold. The occupier controls the military facilities, though, and the benefits from fortifications. They can visit the town with an army and deploy garrison troops, and these are often dark times for the population. There's no civil government, stability drops, and there's a high chance of migration, rebellions, and the such. Now this is also a little crucial to understand in you have a war and much like in many strategy games 
like uh, Crusader Kings especially or any of the other grand strategy games in that realm, you kind of occupy something, but you don't own it, so you can't see those benefits. It's not until the end of the war that that is established, and we'll get to that in just a minute. So if you're looking at the image right now, you'll notice the stripes. The world view in Knights of Honor 2 is a beautiful miniature, and they want it to stay that way, but it is also easy to lose perspective over the political situation. And like in the old game, they're going to add advanced political view, user interfaces with different modes and filters, etc., which will provide lots and lots of information, but, and this is something I really like, they're also working on quick, easy, and clear ways for players to see what's most important in the world at a glance without needing to switch views. So they're adding additional layers of information in the world view itself, which players can toggle on and off with the press of a button or while a hotkey is held down. So in this example, we can see that the town of Barcelona is owned by Aragon, but controlled by the enemies of the player, and the province of Catalonia is occupied. So again, from a, from a new player's perspective, this just gives them a good idea at a glance to see who owns what or how the situation in a war is going. This similar is similar in fashion to Crusader Kings 3 or any other Paradox game. Uh, again, I don't think they're mimicking Paradox per se, but they are on that level of grand strategy. So things like this to make it easy for the player to see something you know, at a, at a glance, at a snap, is going to be across the board a little bit of the same. I'm not going to complain at all. I think this is a great step forward to see how a war is progressing in this instance. Once occupied, the original owner and their allies can attempt to drive back the invaders and restore control of the province. If the population hasn't lost its loyalty, inevitably some of the people will rise up and help in battle for liberation, forming militia squads. Loyal rebel armies can also arise. If a kingdom friendly to the owner faction performs a successful counterattack, the owner regains control of everything once the, you know, the war is over with. Restoration of stability does still take some time regardless, since the population is usually quite agitated, but you know, that is what it is. So this is something that I also agree with. I think it's cool that if you win that war back thanks to your allies, you know, if I have France helping me, France doesn't take Barcelona, and then when the sword's over, it's like, oh, okay, hey, thanks for that free territory. It's no, this belongs to you. We helped you liberate it. It is, it is now yours again. The occupier, on the other side, has several different methods to take full control of a province and become its new owner. If all the initial owner's territories are occupied, the occupier can forcefully annex the lands they control. This is easier if they solely control the defeated kingdom and more complicated if there are multiple kingdoms involved in the occupation. It is a bit unpredictable how the separation of the kingdom territories will go if the spoils are divided among multiple parties. Even if the owner kingdom is not completely occupied, a, a peace treaty can be had in exchange for some lands as well. So it's the it's the reverse side if you are the you know the attacker. So if you are defending and your allies liberate a territory for you, it goes back to you. If you are the attacker and you have allies in the attacker, if they take a territory during this war, I don't think it's gonna be quite so simple, but there's like, hey, we took this for you, here you go. No, I think they keep it, and then the the dividing and the peace treaty thing, it's a little more complicated, which again is a cool fit it's a cool feature, it's a cool factor. I think it's a great move forward. While a war is going on, an individual province can be annexed in several different ways. Some of these options are more forceful than others, but all require the same time and attention of a trusted royal court knight. These methods shouldn't be used haphazardly though, as they have their cost and some may even have various severe repercussions, not the least of which being frowned upon by other kingdoms. There is a risk as being too ruthless could have the world start viewing you as the mad king that must be stopped. So this is a an aggressive expansion kind of deal in that it doesn't really make sense while a war is going on to annex a territory. You kind of have a war goal and if you don't hit that war goal or if you kind of try and piecemeal it as you go along, it's a bit frowned upon, a little irrational. So it's cool to see that if you do too much that is a little is frowned upon that other countries will rise up or other factions rather and will come after you. So with all that in, in tow, 
Even gaining full control and ownership of a province is not the end. At this point, order is restored, and with it, the economy, your development, and army training, but you have to consider things like culture, religion, and the loyalty of the population in the scope of the stability of the province. The kingdom cares too little for these factors and expands quickly and recklessly. Tension within the kingdom's borders can rise and chaos may follow. It takes time and proper measures to reduce the tension, possibly converting the local religion and culture, and in the end, gaining the loyalty of the population to assimilate them. This is all standard grand strategy factoring in here, and even just regular strategy. So if you ignore it for too long, those rebel armies can rise up, you can have all sorts of mannerisms of things go wrong, and you could have lots of trouble on your hands. So in the end, it takes a good strategist to build an empire. Poor decisions can cause kingdoms to crumble from within, so wise actions are needed when problems arise. So whether players choose to tackle problems by gaining the sympathy of their subjects, or by crushing any disobedience with an iron fist, it's completely up to them to forge their people's future. So in comparison to the original Knights of Honor, they are working hard to enable even more playstyles to bring out additional strategies. However, they want to preserve the aggressive conquest playstyle. So that's going to not necessarily be like the most primary way, but again, they didn't want to take that away. And yet they also wanted to create lots of other ways, politically, um, espionage, etc., etc. And so that is the end of Developer Diary number four. So overall, I agree. There's nothing that, that stands out to me that is a hard disagree. Uh, I like the way occupation works. I think it's great. I think the annexation works great as well from what we've seen in this Developer Diary. The actions of your defenders and their allies versus the attackers and their allies in regards to occupation is solid. Uh, it, it removes a lot of frustrations, like uh, with Total War specifically. If you are in a defender war and you have allies that come to your aid, any territories they take are theirs. And that's super frustrating because if I lost one settlement in a province, then I don't get that back because there is no region trading <laughs> since forever. Uh, so to see that we are able to retain that ownership in a defensive war is a great move that I think pretty much every strategy game needs to have in play. So let me know your thoughts on developer diary number four in regards to all of this and what your strategies will be. But let's move on to developer diary number five. So in this developer diary, we'll be talking about the game's most fundamental aspects of warfare, more precisely the focus on marshals, which is a class of knight in the game. So we're going to deal with their role, the types of troops which can fall under their command. So being one of the five main classes in Knights of Honor 2, marshals play a very specific and important part in the game, and that's to lead armies across their provinces, fight enemy forces, and, you know, take settlements and do all of that, you know, warfare stuff. As conquest and expansion were arguably amongst the most important aspects of the original game, we have made sure to encapsulate what marshals were and expand on their concept further. Each knight in the royal court may lead a number of squads depending on his class and specialization. This is a major change compared to the original game, and it means that you can turn your merchants or your spies or your diplomats or even your clerics into somewhat efficient commanders. We'll see more about that in just a minute. The ability to lead troops is unlocked for these classes by certain skills and in specific, all military ones. So if your trusty merchant learns infantry tactics, for instance, this means he can now muster a hefty army and replace the quill with a sword at any time. I like this idea because as I mentioned with the last developer diary, when it comes to these different classes, you're gonna use them obviously for different things. So I had mentioned, you know, using your marshals initially to go conquer a region and then come in with a, with a merchant for that high wealth areas. Well, now it goes a step beyond that because with each knight being able to hold an army, you can now bring your larger army for conquest as a marshal. He can move on and you can bring in your merchant into a region that's not quite so stable and stabilize it with at least a small amount of troops, which might be enough to prevent enemy occupation or rebels from taking the area again. It's a really good system. That way you're not having to employ a ton of marshals to keep the peace. And that's important when it comes to the cost of these knights. However, marshals possess a major advantage to these classes, and that's the ability to control a larger number of squads. 
For the time being, marshals can lead up to nine squads, which is three more than what the other classes may have within their own retinues. Kings and Crusaders also have additional bonuses on the number of squads they can control, making encounters against their forces particularly challenging. You have to remember, the king is a physical presence in this one, so a king can lead an army, which I think is great. It's a great addition. An additional military advantage of marshals is the skills the class can acquire. These mostly focus on aspects of warfare, such as siegecraft, archery, and leadership, and usually grant additional battle tactics and actions that knights of other classes wouldn't normally gain. As marshals are natural-born leaders, they also tend to inspire their troops more, which results in higher morale and more epic battles. So obviously, you're going to want to have marshals on those front lines, um, and then bring in those other smaller, not I'll say smaller, those non-military focused guys into uh, the second line. It is important to note that not every skill is necessarily locked into marshals, as other knights may also end up possessing them in some way or another. To explain this best, we will take the archery skill. For all classes, having that skill means ranged squads under their command have higher attack values. However, if a marshal owns that same skill, he has the added benefit of recruiting archers with an increased squad size. He can even go further and look at spies which instead have their own unique take on archery, both on and off the battlefield. So for this example, they may have a higher chance to quote unquote snipe enemy marshals on a battlefield or obtain an affinity for arranging quote unquote hunting accidents on foreign grounds. These are just a few cool examples. Skills are compelling aspects of how classes work. We'll talk about skills more in a future developer diary, which is something I'm very, very eager about. So it's really cool to see that as those other classes, you can obtain these military things, but they have their own unique twist on them. Again, marshals might be a little more important, but if you were able to catch, I don't know, say an enemy king who may be retreating from a battle with not that many soldiers, and you have your spy as a general of an army with some archers, it wouldn't be a bad thing to try and pursue them to maybe snipe that king and potentially ruin that kingdom. So the idea that each of these skills has their own benefits depending on the class is just, it's just fantastic. So squads and armies can normally be recruited from any town within your kingdom. In general, the resources which are required to produce troops include food and population, just like the first game, which are gathered in each town. Additionally, some squads may also require specific goods produced or imported within your kingdom. This happened as well. A typical example are horses, which are needed for producing all sorts of cavalry. Each squad then consists of a varying number of units, depending on what fits the type of troops from both a balanced and historical point of view. This is what we just mentioned uh, before. So a marshal might have more if, it, if they are archers, for instance. In general, we aim to have the numbers similar to those in the original games as we favor smaller squad sizes and more dynamic battles. I love it. As a rough orientation, most infantry squads currently consist of 30 units, while the majority of cavalry squads have 21 horsemen. Militia type squads are also the biggest since their only combat advantage is their strength in numbers. So at most, if you have a marshal with nine units, let's even say a crusader marshal may have you know, 11 units. At most, you're going to see 350 units on your side, which doesn't make for these ultimate, epic, unbelievable Total War size battles. But again, having played like the Shield Wall mod for Thrones of Britannia, I can tell you that smaller squad size often makes for some really, really interesting, intense, heart wrenching battles. I can tell you that for sure. And this is true in the original uh, Knights of Honor as well. Even though it's not as um, formation heavy or, you know, battle tactic intensive as maybe Total War can be, having those smaller unit sizes really does make for some great battles. So moving on from that specifically, we're going to see what it takes to maintain a marshal with a sizable army. Like other classes in the game, marshals don't work for free and cost gold to be hired. After hiring a knight, players must also pay his wage, which increases progressively, which eats which increases progressively with each additional knight of the same type recruited within court. So in other words, having too many knights of the same class is very, very costly. Additionally, each army squad also has an upkeep cost with the exact resources depending on what the recruiting strategies players decide to utilize. 
All recruited armies take up some amount of food upkeep from the kingdom's global food reserves. Mercenary squads will prefer more gold though. So this is interesting. This is almost taking up a Thrones of Britannia, as I just mentioned, approach. So instead of just recruiting and having upkeep of units cost gold and just straight gold, they now cost gold and food. So it's the idea of a traveling army, an army that actually consumes a large amount of resources to where it is going to cost you in more than one way to have that army. Total War Saga Troy does the same thing. And in fact, with Saga Troy, it expands across all of the available resources in the game. Eventually, your higher tier units cost uh, gold and bronze or um, gold and you know wood or something like that. So it's really cool to see. I like this approach, having armies be more impactful across your campaign rather than just being a gold sink. One significant addition is that squads now also have their own level, I'm assuming experience level, which also increases as they participate in successful battles. Each level increases various squad statistics, such as attack, defense, stamina, and morale. This means that as you find the right synergy between your knight skills and their army's characteristics, you'll want to make sure specific squads are kept alive for longer periods of time. All of these factors play a deciding role in close battles where numbers might not seem to be in your favor. When developing an army, picking a healthy mix of varied units types is often the best approach if you want to be equipped to handle all types of invading troops. This is true across any strategy game. So for example, you may want to include a bunch of spearmen to defend uh, against enemy cav while having infantrymen on your front line, archers on your back line, and maybe some different types of cav on each flank. Or you could take the Total War Attila route. You can focus on one type of unit. I don't know, like mounted horse archers where you could just kite the enemy. I don't know if ammo is a factor in this game. If it's not, then absolutely 100% try and do some uh, horse archer spam because not only will it allow you to kite around enemies, but your composition of your armies, depending on troop types, will depend on how far they can move or how fast, rather, they can move across the campaign map. We see this a little bit in some mods for Total War Attila and possibly some other Total War games in that if you, and in some older historical titles, Rome, etc., etc., where if you have an army of just cav units, they can go a lot further than an army of just infantry, or they can go even further than an army that has infantry and siege weapons. So the idea of uh, a horse archer spam strategy is something I really wanna try now, because it'd be really cool to see how far, how fast I can get across the map, and then how well they perform in battle. If they always succeed, will we have some OP horse archers? Uh, it's very, very possible. So that wraps up developer diary number five. I mean, this is a really good look at warfare, at how your marshals operate, but not only that, how your other generals operate or how your other knights operate. Because again, it's really cool that each skill kind of has its own benefit. So obviously like a, it'd be interesting to see if your merchant knight, for instance, is able to have a skill where they hire mercenaries at a much reduced cost, like a 50% cost reduction or just things of that nature, just being able to utilize all of your knights much stronger than you could in the first game, while still also keeping to their roles and providing a, a, just a bit more strategy in how you approach in increasing your kingdom, as it were. So guys, let me know what you think in all about Developer Diaries 4 and 5. I'm very excited about warfare. I'm very excited about wars in general and how they all operate i tend to be a a slower aggression dude with games like this because i really don't like rebellions if i know i can get a, a country or a region under control quickly then i'll move on but i'm really one of those people that conquers a set of territories and doesn't move on until that region is stable enough for me to be able to move on successfully so let me know if that's your strategy or if you're going to try and just paint the map as quickly as possible all of those sorts of things again if you enjoyed the video be sure to comment down below but also Give the video a like, subscribe to the channel, and turn on bell notifications. All three of those help the channel in ways you cannot understand. If you're looking for other strategy games like Paradox or Total War, be sure to check out my Nexus GG game store, which gives you 100% valid keys directly from the developer, but it helps support this channel as well. Thank you guys for watching. Be on the lookout for the next developer diary as we try and tackle three more in one setting. This is Havoc. Thank you for watching once again. I'm out of here.